All right, let's turn our Bibles this morning to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look together this morning and tonight at verses 1 through 7. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verses 1 through 7. I, I'm excited today about having the privilege to preach from this chapter as I preach a message today called A Set Apart Marriage. Part of the joys uh, of preaching through the Word of God and learning through the Word of God and, and also the challenges um, that come with it is that we get to touch on themes um, that, that we don't uh, necessarily get to touch on as near as much otherwise. And so 1 Peter is one of those books that, that allows us to see at a glimpse a, a, lot, of different, a lot of different themes um, uh, throughout the book. When, when I began to pray and prepare uh, for our walk through 1 Peter together, I, I had one goal in mind, and, and that was this. I wanted our church to know that being a witness for Christ is vital inside the church and outside the church, okay? Uh, inside our home, outside the home. Being a witness for Christ, being set apart for Christ is vital inside and outside. And so in chapter 1, just giving you a, a if you've never heard anything yet from the ver- book of 1 Peter, um, I, I'm going to give you some of those key themes as we head into chapter 3 today. I, if you looked at chapter 1, we talked about how the church is set apart uh, in our confidence in Christ, but also in our commitment to Christ as a part of his family. Later on in, in verses 13 through 20, 21 in chapter 1, we're, to, to, we're called to be set apart in our, in our mind. Not, not just in our actions, not just in our bodies. We are called to be set apart for Christ as well in, in our minds. If you look at verse 22 in chapter 1 through chapter 2 verse 3, we, we're, taught, we're called to be set apart by the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God dictates our lives. It's a powerful Word. Uh, it, it, the Word of God is purifying. The Word of God is meant to be proclaimed, shared with others. But then when we get into chapter 2, we're ta- we talk about how we're called to be set apart as the church. And, and so we discussed how there's value, there's great value in being a part of the body of Christ, the family of God. And then we venture into chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, and we're called to be set apart from the rest of the world. And so we spent some time talking about how our position is different from the world in Christ. Our praise, uh, the, the pattern that we live our lives. Everything is different because we belong to Jesus. We are possessions of all my God through faith in Christ Jesus. And and, and then we arrive to the latter part of chapter 2, and this is where we spent the last couple of weeks. We've talked about being citizens. So so the week of the fourth, um, it fit perfectly. We talked about being uh, model citizens, Christian citizens uh, who happen to be Christians who happen to live in the U.S. And we talked about being citizens set apart for God, submitting to those who are in governing authority. We, We talked about the next week, last week, we talked about being laborers. All right, uh, how, how am I supposed to live at my job? I'm supposed to submit to those that, are, that, are, that have governance over me at, at work, who have authority over me at work. And, and, then, and then Peter even goes to say, even if you have to suffer for Christ, if you suffer for doing right, Everybody else is doing wrong, but, but at your job or being a citizen, uh, if everybody else is doing wrong, but you choose to do right and you suffer for it, great glory is given to God. And so Peter says that, that our lives are meant, you, you finish the last part of chapter 2, he says our lives are meant to be lived in the pattern of our Savior. He says we're to walk in Jesus' steps. Now we get to uh, chapter 3. We get to chapter 3. And, and Peter is continuing this theme of submission. And now he brings it to our relationships. Okay, he says if you, it's one thing to submit to governing authorities. It's another thing to submit uh, to those who have authority of you at, at work. But now he says, we're going to submit in our relationships. He brings this close to home by talking to husbands, by talking to wives, to talking about men and women about their relationships at home and how that reflects a set-apart life in Christ. Now, it's one thing, it's one thing to model Jesus outside of the church. And hey, we're all called to do that as Christ followers. It's one thing to model Jesus outside of the church. It's a completely different thing to model uh, Jesus inside the church as it is the outside of the church. But, but you know what? It, it, it means very little. If I live for Christ outside of the church, if I live for Christ inside the church, it means very little if I don't bring it home. <laughs> if I don't live for Christ at home, what is your witness outside of the home? <laughs> What is your witness in in, in the world? What is your witness in the church if you can't live it at home? I I do know this. 
how I am at home, the husband that I am at home, the father that I am at home, the Christ follower that I am at home will trickle into what I do and who I am in the church, but also in the world. You can only hide for so long. So, so if, my, if my home life uh, lacks discipline, okay, if my home life lacks proper submission in, in, in a husband's regard, uh, his calling is to revere, to respect, to honor, to, to cherish his wife, to love his wife uh, as Christ loved the church. If my home life lacks discipline, if my home life lacks submission or, or respect, if my home life lacks commitment or faithfulness, if my home life lacks intentionality and, and worship, then you can better believe that that will be reflected some way in the church and sadly in the world as well. There is a call to be a Christ follower even behind closed doors. And so if believers are called to be set apart, then we have to live set apart in the world. We have to live set apart at work. We need to live set apart in the church. We need to live set apart at home. So today we're going to venture into your home. We're going to venture into my home and we're going to see what God has to say about marriage. This this sacred union, this covenant between one man, one woman for life set apart for the glory of God. Now I know what the temptation is today. I said this in the first service. I'll say this today in this service. The temptation is, is that you saw the title of the message and, and, and you thought, well, he's talking about marriage today. He's going to talk about, uh, he's going to talk about married couples today. I'm not married. Uh, therefore, I'm not going to need to hear any of this message today. So I'm going to tune out. You're wrong for that. All right. Uh, and, he, and here's why. God has something to say to you if you are single today. Marriage involves a man and a woman. And I'm going to make a strong guess that you are one of the two. <laughs> All right? Although we live in the 21st century where that's grossly unfortunate. And you might not be able to tell. Everybody here is a man or a woman, an individual man or a woman. Okay, so you are part of that relationship, whether it be today or tomorrow or, or in the past. I, I'm just saying there's something for you if you're single today. As a man and woman, there are going to be characteristics that you can draw from the text that should be said of your life regardless of whether you're married or not. You may be one who has been married before, you know, and you're thinking, well, I don't have to listen to the message today because I've been married before, I've been there, I've done that, and I'm not going back. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, instead of you being a, instead of you being in wedlock, maybe you've been in a deadlock before. Okay. And, and so I, I'm sorry, and I, I'm sincere about this. I, I'm sorry if, if your marriage experience um, did not did not uh, reflect Christ. I, I'm sorry if you've been in an abusive relationship or or you you've suffered. Okay, at the hands of, of another spouse. And, and so here's what I I would like to pray for you today that you would hear the message and that you would be drawn to God's original intent for marriage, okay, and that, and that you would seek the Lord, okay, for, for maybe what went wrong or, or things that can be corrected, okay, God has a word for us today about biblical perspective on marriage. Maybe you've been through an ugly, ugly divorce and, 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 and your view of marriage is flawed. God gives us a word about how marriage should look Maybe God will realign your thoughts on that. I know that there are singles here today who have no plans to get married yet. And if some of you have plans to get married, maybe you should change your plans. All right. Don't tune out the word today. For one day God may change your mind and heart concerning marriage. And when that day comes, God will give you whom he desires. For those that may be engaged to be married or thinking about getting married or serious about marriage, 1 Peter 3 gives you a blueprint, folks, a blueprint of what marriage should look like. To parents who have, who have children and they still live in your home or parents who have children who are pondering the idea of getting married, use this message to share this with your children and how they are to pursue the will of God concerning marriage. Marriage. You see what I'm saying? There's something for everybody today. And I think this applies to everyone from husband to wife to child. First Peter 3 tells us what a marriage should look like in a set apart, uh, in a set apart relationship with Jesus. So if you're going through a challenging time in your marriage to those who, are, who, who, may, who may be in an unequally yoked marriage, when I say unequally yoked, I'm talking about you've got a believing spouse and an unbelieving spouse in the home. 
Okay, and that's evident. God has a word today for you as well. Regardless, regardless, the greatest thing that we all can do today is to pray for marriages all around. That could be your role this morning. But my point is, listen up. Don't, don't tune out. Hear what the Lord has to say to us in 1 Peter chapter 3. And when you think about the, the, the realm of God's word, God really has something to say about everything, doesn't he? All right, so we can find value in that. Let's read the text this morning, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And, and today and tonight, I'm going to provide two foundations for set-apart marriage. Now, the first thing I'm going to share today is about the goal of marriage. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so, but let's read through the text together. He, he begins with wives. Notice, women, that there are six verses devoted to the wife, and there's one verse devoted to the husband. You know what that means? It was written by a man. <laughs> I was going to say that men just don't listen as much. Women, women have more words. They can say focus. No, there, there's, there's, a lot to, there's a lot of weight to bear in verse 7. And yes, a man did write this, Miss Ann. So it says, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be one by the conduct of their wives. Now, a lot of people, and here's why I'm doing this, okay? I recognize not everybody will come back tonight. I hope that you will, okay, because this is a, one of those continuing messages. But when you say that they without a word may be won by their conduct, when you see they without a word, some people use that as an advantage to say, well, the gospel was best used sometimes without words. You might be the only Bible that people were, you know, hear that said. Uh, the gospel, the words are, ne words are necessary with the gospel, Hey, you, have to, you have to proclaim the word of God. It's not saying that a wife won't proclaim the word of God. Actually, what that means in verse 1, it says that they without a word, meaning that if you've got an unbelieving spouse in the home or you've got a spouse who is not walking with Jesus, a wife by her example, if she is a follower of Christ, a wife by example by her conduct should be able to draw her husband to that in a relationship with Christ. And she's not going to have to word him about it. She's not going to have to nag him about it. She's not going to have to turn up a Billy Graham sermon to the highest volume of the house and say, I'm giving him Jesus whether he wants it or not. See what I'm saying? Well, without a word saying that without a nagging word, without, without, without belittling the man, without, without challenging okay, him as, as a man, uh, you, you're able to win them by the conduct of their wives. Verse 2 says, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So tonight we will talk about the role of the wife, the role of the woman in the home. And, and, she, and she is marked by submission but steadfast faith in the Lord. And that should draw her husband to Christ, even if he doesn't have a relationship with Christ. Look at verse 3. It says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart. Peter's saying here, you want to draw your husband to Christ? It's not going to be by how pretty you are. And you are pretty women, okay? It's not, it's not about that. It's not, it's, not, it's not about whether you're beautiful or not. It's not about whether you can dress up or not. Sometimes in the legalistic realm, okay, those take a lot of liberty with this verse, and they'll say, well, women aren't supposed to wear any, any makeup. They're not supposed to wear any perfume. They're not supposed to wear any gold earrings, dangly earrings. They're not supposed to wear any of that. It's not what he's saying there. Don't make the Bible say something that it doesn't say. It says, do not let your adornment be merely outward. Adornment. What you're dressed up, don't, don't let the essence of your being be in who you are dress-wise. Let who you are be who Christ says you are and claims you to be inwardly. Okay, so he says, don't let your, don't, don't, don't let your adornment be merely outward. Verse 4 says, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. That will draw a man to the Lord, far more than high heels, <laughs> far more than jewelry, far more than the outward appearance of a person. In this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham. We'll touch on, on, on them tonight, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Then he comes down to this verse 7. Husbands, likewise, 
dwell with them with understanding. There's a role for a man too. The role of a man is to be considerate of his wife. The role of a man is to be compassionate towards his wife. The, the, the role of a man is to give honor, verse 7 says, to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. A lot of times, here's what happens. You see the weaker vessel there in verse 7, and men will do this. They'll, they'll grunt real loud and they'll pull their pants up and they'll say, and that's why women should submit because you're weaker That'll get you slapped. <laughs> Think about it. The wife should be regarded as a weaker vessel, not because she's weaker in, in, in whom she is as a human being, whom she is as, as she belongs in the body of Christ. A wife is weaker physically. That's the only thing it's bringing out. A husband, a husband or a man is going to be a stronger vessel physically. But look at what the verse says. He says, uh, dwell with them with understanding. Respect them. Give honor to them. As to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together. See, see, if it were about if it were about a man being greater than a woman, if that if that were the case, we wouldn't be heirs together, right? We are made in the image of God, male and female. Okay, the role of a man, the reason that the man has authority in the house, it, it, is, it is a mere position given by God, granted by God. Okay, and nothing more, nothing more. It, it's, about, it's about how God has ordered things. Okay, it's about order, it's about authority. It's not something that a man just beats over the head of his wife to say, I'm over you, I own you. That's not what this says. As being heirs together of the grace of life, that's your prayers may not be hindered. We'll touch more on that later tonight. Let's get started today. We're talking about the foundations of a, of a set-apart marriage. I, I got a little story to share with you. There was a couple that were celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary, and, and, and both of them were 60 years of age. And, and God was so proud of this couple. He's so happy with this couple. He, he got word to them that whatever they prayed, Whatever they prayed on their anniversary, he would answer that prayer immediately. And, 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 so, and so the wife, she got word of it that God was answering prayers immediately. And so she says, oh, Lord, you know my heart and you know how bad I want a vacation in the Caribbean. Oh, Lord, would you send me a, a vacation in the Caribbean? And poof, immediately, God sends her to the Caribbean and they're on vacation. And then the husband, he's like, oh, this worked. And, 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 so, and so the husband, he says, Lord, Lord, you know my heart. And you know that I would love to be married to someone that is 30 years younger than I am. <laughs> Poof! He comes back too and he's 90 years old. <laughs> <laughs> you should be careful what you pray for. As you think about your marriage, as you think about other marriages, remember that our challenge today is to be praying for one another, okay? Encouraging one another. Whatever state your marriage may be in, whatever state others' marriages may be in, let's be prayerful. Let's pray for the will of God. Let's pray for God's best uh, to be honored, obeyed, and followed in the marriage. Whether you're married, whether you're not. Whether, whether you're having a difficult time, whether you're having a great time. Uh, uh, whether you're, you're praying about being married and engaged, uh, or, whether, or whether or not. Uh, whether or not. It, the, the goal here is to pray for one another, that God's will would be done in our marriages. And so there's two foundations. Here's the first I want us to see this morning. Let's talk about the goal of marriage. Let's talk about the goal of marriage. I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. The goal of marriage is to reflect the image and glory of God. Okay, to honor Christ, to worship Christ, to praise Christ, uh, to, to glorify Christ. Why does anything exist anyways? Have you ever asked that question? Why does anything exist at all? Uh, uh, I, I was reading Tony Evans earlier this week, and he wrote, You exist for God. And he says, That, that is why you were created. You, you were not made just to get a good job. You were not made to live happily ever after. You were not made to get married and have kids. Those you call blessings. Those you call as gifts. Uh, you were created, though, to bring honor and glory to God and to accomplish his purposes on earth through your life. That, that's why you will find no rest in life until you find rest in him. All right? so, so from the start of the text and, and for every purpose behind everything, 
We should want to follow the example of Jesus Christ. We should want to strive to serve and honor and glorify Jesus in everything we do. Because here's the thing. If you and I put out there all of our goals and all of our dreams and we achieved everything we ever wanted to achieve and we had everything that we wanted to have, and if, we got everything, if, we, if we got everything that we thought or we thought we were entitled to, if we, if we missed the opportunity, though, to glorify Christ and to know Christ, Christ and to be about Christ, we have missed it all together. If you got everything you wanted and you didn't have Jesus, what do you have? Notice the very first part of verse 1 and verse 7 here in chapter 3. This is all I want you to look at today. Okay, in, 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 this, first, in this first message, verse 1, verse 7, chapter 3, look at the first part. It says, wives likewise. Okay, if you look at verse 7, it says, husbands Likewise, when you read the word likewise, it means in the same manner. Now, here, here's something that, that I want you to do. That means that there's already a pattern to follow. Okay, if Peter is saying to do likewise or to follow in the same manner, there is a pattern that has already been set all the way back in chapter 2 and into chapter 3. I'm going to give you a guess. What has been the key word in chapter 2 and now carrying in chapter 3? What is the key word? Oh, you're doing it again. You're, you're being weak with saying the word. Come on, say it. What's the word? Oh, it don't sound like you want to. <laughs> Submission. He uses the word submit. That's for the third time we have seen this. Submit. We see, what do we see before we get to chapter 3? We see Christ submitting to the will of God for his life. And we are called to walk in in his steps and in chapter 3 it begins likewise wives verse 7 says likewise husbands now here's what it's all about jesus was submissive to god's will for his life what did he do what did jesus do we're talking about governing authorities jesus submitted himself to governing authority he submitted himself to even to even evil men Okay, he wanted to abuse him and harm him. He submitted himself to them. And, the ver and, and Scripture says he did not open his mouth in retaliation. He, he did not raise his fist and fight back. What did Jesus do? He allowed the will of God to happen in his life so what? All the world could be, would be blessed. And as Jesus did, so should I. Now, how does this apply to marriage? Marriage does, does reflect Christ. <laughs> And his love for the church and what he did for the church, a Christian husband and wife should seek to follow the example of Jesus in the marriage. And, and you know what? He's going to give us a layout of what that looks like in the next verses. In the next six verses, he tells us what a marriage should look like. Now, I don't want to. I don't want to fly through this text, so I'm not going to do that. I don't. I don't want to rush this message because I believe that that this is where marriages fall off track. Okay, this is where they get lost. This is where marriages get left behind. This is when marriages are. are are given up on the reason that marriages fail is because people don't make major of these minute details we don't want to follow god's prescription we don't want to follow god's plan we don't want to follow god's word for our marriage we know what we want and so we don't see what God has to say about the marriage relationship. And oftentimes, the reason that marriages fail and crumble is because the goal is known and not attained or pushed for, or the goal is known and it's not desired or reached, or, or the goal is not at the forefront of our minds, or the goal that God has for our marriage is not really the goal that you have for your spouse or I have for my spouse. That's why marriages fail. Because Christ is not pursued. All right? Take a moment and, and do this, okay? Write out, if you're married, if you're not married, if, if, okay? If you're married today, write out, write out the goals that you have or the goal that you have or have had this past week for your marriage. If you're not married, I want you to go ahead and start pre-planning. Write out the goals that you have for your future, your future marriage. And here's the thing. Don't you cheat and don't you lie. If your goal in marriage this week has not been to glorify Jesus, if your goal in the past in your marriage has not been to glorify Jesus, don't you lie and say, my goal in marriage is to glorify Jesus. That's not right. What is your goal? What has been your goal in your marriage? If I truly want the best for our marriage, I have to look at the example of Jesus. Now listen, 
You've got dreams and you've got plans and you've got aspirations for your home. That is great. That is outstanding. And my wife and I do, you know, we, we want to see our children grow. We want them to be godly young men. We want them to be respectful young men. We want them to be respectable young men. We want them to be independent young men, not to push them out or anything, uh, you know. But, but there's going to come a time where we want them to be able to do things, you know, on their own, make their own decisions. We want them to have, they want to have good godly goals, and we want them to make an eternal impact for Christ. That is an aspiration. That is a dream. That is something I believe God will honor. I have something else. My wife and I, uh, we, we want to be debt-free one day. And so we're doing everything that we can right now to be debt-free in less than 10 years. And so, and so we believe that we want to be debt-free. Why? So that we can give more, right? So that we, I like to give. So, we can, so that we can give more, but also so we can go more. All right? There, there's a missional purpose in that. We want our relationship to grow stronger over the years. My wife and I have been married 12 years this, uh, this December, Okay, and, and here's the thing. We want to be closer today than we were yesterday. We want to be closer in year 12 than we were in year 11, all right? And, and we want to be an example in, in our family. We want to be a testimony to the Lord's love and faithfulness and blessing to us. We have goals. I believe God is honored in those goals, those aspirations. But above those goals has to be the main goal. And that main goal together is to glorify Christ, to make much of Christ, to worship Christ, to praise and enjoy a deep relationship with Christ. That should be the primary goal. That should be what I'm after as a husband. That should be what my wife is after as a, as a wife. That's what I should be leading my wife to do. That is what we should all long for marriage. And if that is not the case, if your chief reason for marriage uh, exists uh, for, for anything other than reflecting the image and glory of God, your goals are amiss. I know that's hard to hear. Okay, I know that's hard to hear, but because, because a lot of people, the goal for their marriage is to have lots of money, a comfortable lifestyle, and live in a nice home and have a great big retirement. And that's the goal. You know, success. If Christ is not the goal, we miss it. All right? Uh, if I say the goal of my marriage is to have this number of children or to not have any children at all, that's the goal of marriage. It's all about us. Okay, I'm missing it. If I say the goal of marriage is to have a healthy, intimate relationship with my wife physically, I'm missing it. And you're welcome for not going into detail about what that means. <laughs> All right? Uh, so, so we don't have awkward lunch comments today, okay? So, so if that's the goal, and Christ isn't, then we've missed it. Marriage does not exist for us to keep up with the Joneses. I don't even have Joneses on my street, <laughs> So I don't have anybody to keep up. We're missing the goal of marriage. It's always been Jesus. The goal of marriage is always Jesus. We are to have a spirit of submission and commitment to what Christ has done. And the goal of marriage is to reflect the glory of God within us. Marriage does not exist for us. Marriage exists for God. And he created it for his glory. It's not our glory. It's not about our glory. It belongs to him. Do we benefit from marriage? Man, you better believe it. Without a doubt, we do. But if marriage exists primarily for man's glory and man's needs and man's wants and, and not for God, then it's not, then it's not living out what it was intended to do, and that was to magnify the glory of the Lord. And that changes everything. Okay, why is Peter given these instructions to begin with? You know why he's given rules or why he's given, not, I don't want to say rules, instruction. I like that better. You know why he's given instruction? On, on, on necessities in the marriage or foundations in the marriage because they're necessary. And the reason that they're necessary is because we're corrupt. We're sinful people. When he writes this to, to these believers here in the first century, a lot of them were in unequally yoked relationships, which means they were in flawed relationships. And, and so God in his foreknowledge knew that when Peter wrote this letter, it was going to be to imperfect men and women who were trying to be in a perfect union and they were trying to do it without their perfect God. All right? You got to understand, while the primary goal of marriage is to glorify Jesus and serve Jesus, so there's a second part to this, that goal has been compromised by our sin. Okay? Now, now I, want you to, I want you to know this, okay? Uh, it, it didn't take long for you to realize that the man that you married or the woman that you married weren't perfect. I want to ask you, how long was it after the, after the great celebration, after the great marriage day, how, how long did it take for you to realize I married an imperfect fool? <laughs> how long did it take 
I, hey, listen, my wife knew I was flawed before we got married. Okay, we, we're, we're married to sinful people. It reminds me, you know, of two young preachers. They were preaching at a, they were at a preaching conference listening to some older, more experienced, more wise men. And, and they were listening to pastors share some of their favorite messages. And one of the experienced pastors, he gets up and he says, I'm going to share with you uh, about my favorite Mother's Day message. This is a great message. And he began his message by saying, the best years that I ever spent in my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. And he said, and that woman is my mother. And one of the young preachers, you know, nudged his butt and he said, now that's how you start a sermon. That, that's good stuff. I'm going to share that the next time that I have a Mother's Day message. That's an attention grabber. And his friend said, oh, you better be careful with that. That's a tricky sentence. You don't want to mess that one up. You'd better write it down. He's like, no, 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 don't need to do that. It's all in my head. I'm going to share this right, okay? And so ne the next Mother's Day come, this young preacher gets into the pulpit and he starts by saying, the best years of my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. And he paused, and he said, for the life of me, I can't remember who that was. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good time to forget your joke, all right? But there's some truth to that. The goal of marriage is to spend time, get this, to spend time in the arms of Jesus. Marriage, according to Ephesians 5, is about reflecting submission to the Lord all right? I, I submit to my husband, the verse says, if I'm a wife, I submit to my wife as I submit to the Lord. If you look at the first part of Ephesians chapter 5, or what goes into Ephesians chapter 5, it says you're supposed to submit to one another as you submit to the, submit to the Lord. I submit to Christ first. Okay? I belong to Christ before I belong to my wife. All right? And, and vice versa. And loving service to one another as Christ has so loved us and served us. It's easy, though. It's easy to wind up in the arms of somebody else. Instead of being in the arms of the Lord, we find ourselves in the arms of compromise. Instead of being in the arms of the Lord in our marriage, we, we find ourselves in the arms of greed or in the arms of dominance or in the arms of selfishness or in the arms of anger or in the arms of rudeness or misunderstanding and argument, virtually the, the arms of sin. Now, I want you to know this. Just as you have God who has a goal in your marriage, you know, to glorify the Lord Jesus, that is the goal of the Lord for your marriage, you have an enemy, a real enemy, who wants to steal that goal and glory and wants to compromise that goal and glory with his own. And so what does Satan want for your marriage? What does he want for your home? He, he wants for you to question the authority of God and direction of God over your life. And so Satan is quick to say, uh, you don't need to follow the word of God in your marriage. Do it your way. Make up your own rules, okay? Uh, uh, he, wants you to he wants you to question, okay, or deceive you into thinking that if I trust in God and I follow God in, my, in his example, then I'm missing out on something or, 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 or there's something better out there. Uh, Satan wants to destroy intimacy in your marriage. Satan wants to destroy unity in your marriage. Satan wants to destroy the permanence and covenant and dependence that you're to have in your marriage and, and upon God and each other. And he wants for you to end up in the arms of of another. Do you even realize, folks? Think about your home. Do you even realize that, that your family is being warred over all the time by the enemy? I look back in Genesis chapter 3. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. It's one of the saddest, okay, in all the accounts of the Bible. You have Adam and Eve, and they are in perfect harmony with the Lord and with each other. First married couple. They're basking in the radiance and the glory of God. And, and you know, in Genesis chapter 3, sin messes everything up. And, and here's what happens. God confronts them after they sin. And this is what he, has, this is what he says to Eve. There, there's a lot lost, okay? There's a lot of things that were lost that day in the garden. Not just in marriage, but in life. Okay, their bond with one another, that was lost. Their, their peace with God, that was broken. Their security with God, that was broken. The sanctity of their union, that was broken. Their minds, their eyes, their flesh, their bodies, they're now vulnerable for sin. And there has been this constant struggle ever since the days of Adam. There has been a constant struggle struggle in relationships ever since the goal of marriage has been compromised by our sin and, and, and when God is addressing Eve 
He says something to her in Genesis 3, verse 16. He says, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. In the same language, Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, the same thing is said to, to, uh, to Cain, their son. Sin wanted to master Cain. Sin had a desire for Cain, but God says, you can overcome that. Because of the curse, though, Eve would have to fight. And here's what that verse means. Because when you look at it at face value, you see Genesis 3.16, it says, your desire should be for your husband. You're like, oh, that's great. My desire should be for my husband. That's a good thing, right? Until you know what it means. Genesis 3.16 means that Eve would have to fight a desire to master her husband. To one-up her husband. To rebel against the authority that God gave her husband over her. A desire that worked against God's order for the home. Why am I bringing out Genesis 3.16? What does that have to do with 1 Peter chapter 3? Well, here's what it has to do. Verse 1 in chapter 3 of 1 Peter says, Wise likewise, be submissive to your own husband's. And when you realize how the goal, of Christ, the goal of God is to glorify Christ and how that goal has been affected by our sin, God tells Eve her desire is going to be for her husband. And you might think that that sounds like a good thing, but it's not. God's not speaking of a sexual or romantic desire. He's not telling her that Adam's going to be a perfect match or soulmate for her. Genesis 3.16 is a picture of a curse that God is giving over sin and judgment. And we see that desire spoken of as an aggressive desire that wants control we have issues in our marriages don't we because wives want control they want to have dominance they want to have authority and then you have husbands who want to rule over their wives with inappropriate aggressiveness and it says that Adam, verse 16 says, and he shall rule over you. Ruling over her does not mean that he has authority or leadership in the home. Leader, what that means in 3.16 says that Adam will rule over his wife, and it speaks of a dominant, harsh, and controlling rule. Let's put this in perspective. Now for thousands of years, husbands and wives have this challenge I see it in my own marriage. I see it in your marriages. You see it in each other's marriages. When a husband steps out of line in stewarding the marriage relationship, sometimes he's too aggressive. Sometimes he's too passive. That causes conflict. How about this? Sometimes a wife steps out of line and she seeks to control the marriage or rule her husband or command him to do this or she wants to be the head of the house. When that happens, when that happens, we are out of line. We are out of order with what the Word of God says for a marriage. Sin distorts the intended order of things. There's an ideal way for husbands and wives to relate to one another. And just like anything else in life, there are two ditches that we find ourselves in. Either we're too passive men or we're too aggressive. And women, either we're too aggressive and controlling or we're too passive. The gospel changes everything about your marriage. What the gospel does, what 1 Peter 3 does, is it puts things in line. It fuels and informs right views and attitudes about marriage as we recognize that marriage exists to glorify God, especially when we see Jesus as the perfect husband, as the picture of what a husband should be and how his bride, the wife, should be. And this is how I'd like to end the message this morning. We need to understand this. We cannot follow the example of Christ. We cannot glorify God in our marriage. We cannot serve the Lord and praise the Lord and make Christ known in our marriage to the fullest measure until Christ is first Savior and then submit to Him as Lord of everything, even in our marriage relationship. This entire text focuses on the theme, submission. And it's not just about marriage. This is about submission to Almighty God with your life. And with your life includes a relationship that is in marriage. Now, I know many of you cringe today when you hear that word, submission. Because you think of weakness and you think of, you think of someone controlling you or ordering you around. Biblical submission isn't that at all. Submission is not about you, the wife, doing everything your husband says. Because sometimes the things your husbands tell you to do aren't godly. And you don't have to do that. 1 Peter 3 tells us that. And living as if you left your brain in the chapel the day you got married and your husband's going to control your every thought. That's not godly either. Submission does not mean you're always going to agree with each other. 
Submission does not mean that I put my husband's will above my will or the will of God or above the will of God. Your husband's not God. Submission does not mean that you find your purpose in your spouse. If you read further in 1 Peter 3, you find that, that Jesus plainly says to those readers that a woman does not find her purpose in her appearance, her adornment. She does not even find her purpose in her husband. She finds her purpose in God and hopes that her husband will join her there. Now, here's the question. Marriage is a blessing. Marriage is a freedom. Marriage is a joy. It's best when it's glorifying Christ. My question today is, have you given your family Okay, have you given your family, have you given your marriage, have you given your spouse, have you given yourself to Jesus Christ? Have you submitted your marriage to the lordship of Christ, or are you trying to lord over it yourself? Because the goal will not be reached to reflect the image and glory of God if the goal of your marriage is to be in control. Peter says, likewise, wives, In the same manner as Christ, if you read the verses before, Christ died so that we might live in righteousness. By whose stripes we were healed, you were like sheep going astray, but now you have Christ ruling your souls. Think about this, okay? In the days of the first century, when this was written, okay, women, women did not have freedom. They were objectified. Women, women, did, uh, women had to be uh, masters, sort of slaves um, to their husbands, and the husbands could rule them around and do whatever they wanted to do. Well, well Peter said, now you've got freedom in Christ, and your marriage is supposed to be a lot different. Right? And, and because you have that newfound freedom in Christ, you're going to have to bring under, under the lordship of Christ your relationship, even if your husband doesn't know the Lord. A lot of those men in the first century when they were married and their wives came to Christ, a lot of those men didn't know Jesus. And so it was, it was vital, okay, it was vital for the woman to reflect the image of God, her newfound relationship in Christ, so that her husband would see and know the Lord and follow to you. Isn't that neat? This has very little to do with your marriage. It has very much to do with Christ being Lord of your life and then giving him your marriage, whatever state it may be. Let me pray for you today. Lord, uh, I, I come to you this morning with a, with just a heavy heart, a heavy burden for, um, for this church because we